Adriana Andova for the first presentation about some experimental results in evolutionary multitasking. So, hello. Um, the outline of this presentation will be as following. First, I will explain what is active optimization and what are evolutionary algorithms. Then, what is evolutionary multitasking and the experiments we did on it. Finally, I will give conclusion and future work. So, uh, op the optimization is the task of finding the minimum or the maximum value of uh, some function. It uh, can have uh, various constraints, uh, but in this, in this, in our case, we only use problems that have boundary constraints, so much more simpler. And uh, each solution is represented by a solution vector of, uh, with uh, n, n dimensions, when, where n represents the number of uh, decision, vari uh, decision variables that we want to optimize. Now, um, when solving an optimization problem, we usually try to solve, uh, to use uh, mathematical methods, but sometimes this is not possible. And in such cases, we use evolutionary algorithms. Um, these algorithms have uh, started by uh, having uh, some initial sets of solutions, which are uh, then, uh, because there are a large amount of these solutions, we can use them as a simulation, which goes into the, uh, the cycle of selection, reproduction, and replacement. And uh, these cycles uh, repeat uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, over time the population evolves in such way that it solves the problem uh, better. And uh, after some criteria is satisfied, we come to the uh, end of the cycle and then the, these solutions that are uh, present at the population at that time are optimized solutions. Now, um, but evolutionary algorithms usually solve one optimization problem at a time. However, recently there has been uh, an effort of uh, solving multiple optimization problems simultaneously, and the method for this is called evolutionary multitasking. And uh, to, to do this, we have to uh, put all of the problems in the same um, uh, in the same uh, decisions uh, in the same space, and also we want to to transfer information. So uh, this is done by uh, having one single uh, solution vector that solves multiple problems, and it has variables from uh, the components have uh, values from zero to one. So there, this is one example for let's say uh, a solution for vector that solves two problems. The first uh, five components will, will be used for this first problem and then all of the components are used for the second problem. And as you can see, these components are uh, common in both problems and in this way, uh, this is how we transfer the information. Now, dividing uh, the population in evolutionary multitasking is divided into k subpopulations and it, uh, where k is the number of problems that we want to solve, and each uh, subpopulation is specialized on one problem. Individuals inside the sub subpopulations usually reproduce between, uh, with each other. However, sometimes it happens that uh, with some small probability, individuals from two different uh, subpopulations are chosen for reproduction. And in this way, uh, this is where this transfer of, of information happens. And in such cases, the child solution is not, uh, it's not evaluated on all problems that the parents solve, but only on uh, one problem, which is actually um, for one parent, which we choose randomly from all the, all the parents that are used for, for the reproduction. And as you can imagine, um, not all problems contain useful information that can be transferred. And because of this, uh, there has been developed a synergy metric that, that shows how efficiently two problems can be solved together. 
and uh, this uh, this synergy metric takes the derivative of the of the uh, function or the problem and then checks if uh, if uh, one solution has the same direction uh, as uh, the op uh, for one problem as the optimum for another problem so it it, ch it checks if this solution is good for solving the other problem as well and um, yeah, and then we we all, we did uh, some experiments with uh, evolutionary multitasking. Now, um, what uh, what I pre uh, is presented here in this figure is uh, the normalized difference between multitask and single task optimization, where the optima of the sphere and the active function are far from each other, and. Uh, uh, this is uh, the values over uh, over uh, the, the difference over time, and if the difference is pos is positive, it sh it means that uh, uh, evolutionary multitasking is more efficient. However, if the difference is negative, it means that uh, solving uh, a single task at a time is more efficient. And you can see here that uh, when the optima are far. Uh, the, the single task optimization performs better. And to, to explain this, we, uh, we visualize the problems with these two figures. Now, uh, here, the, the, uh, the shape of the figure represents the problem in a way, uh, in such a way that uh, the, the Z value is the fitness uh, function. So, um, we the optimum for the Eckley problem, which is this figure, is, is, in this, uh, in, is in, at this point. And the, the color of the space represents the synergy, uh, the synergy between the problems. And this is also for the sphere problem, where the optimum of, is, of course, here. Now, um, we can see here that the synergy is, for most of the space, negative for both problems. There is a bigger difference uh, in the synergy with, in the ACLI problem, and this is why we can see here that ACLI is, is solved much, much worse. Now, when the optima are cl closer to each other, we can see that evolutionary multitasking solves better because the, the, the uh, values are positive. And this is once again explained with, uh, with these uh, two figures. So here is uh, the active function and the sphere function when the optima are closer to each other. And we can see here that in the active function, most of the, uh, uh, of the fitness values are static. They, they don't change. Yeah. And this is also shown, and this means that the, 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 the derivative is also zero. And this is why this whole space is green. It, it, it is a zero value. On the other hand, for the active function, um, we can see that uh, all of this part of the space uh, takes positive values, which means that uh, these two problems, in the, uh, solutions in this, uh, in this space uh, from the sphere, uh, sphere function can uh, benefit the active problem. And uh, yes, and... Um, I'm not sure what happened now. The, the rest of the presentation, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a, a careful copy. So uh, I can uh, continue in this way. So uh, here, here you can see the the like. Um, then we we continued our experiments in such way that uh, the 
the two we, we multiplied each of these uh, sphere and Eccle function in such way that we shifted the optimum the, the optima a bit and then we we did it for 25 times for each problem which meant that we were solving this time 50 problems simultaneously and we can see the same um, patterns at, as as before with uh, with when solving only two problems in the next experiment, we did uh, we did it, this on six different um, uh, optimization functions and uh, problems, and and uh, and then um, we can see that each uh, function is uh, it, it has different patterns. So let's let for example, this Schwefel function is not solved efficiently together with the others. When multiplying this uh, in the same way uh, with uh, shifting the, the optimum uh, seven times, we can see also similar patterns, which once again show, this, show that uh, actually it's not so uh, uh, important how many problems we try to solve, but whether they are similar or not. So to conclude this, the presentation, we can say that uh, evolutionary multitasking is uh, about solving multiple optimization problems simultaneously. It shows uh, promising results for similar problems, but with, when the uh, problems are different, then uh, the performance drops. And also it shows that um, uh, the number of problems that we try to solve with uh, evolutionary multitasking is not so important as is the similarity between the problems. Finally, uh, we also visualized the synergy uh, for, for two problems and in this way we, we showed that it's, it's uh, useful for exp explaining why these uh, problems are efficient and solving them together. Now, for future work, we will test evolutionary multitasking on real-world scenarios which m with more complex functions and constraints. And also, we will develop machine learning methods to predict when multitasking uh, a set of problems would be successful. Uh, thank you for your uh, time. And if you have any questions. No, it's uh, because, uh, as I said, it's uh, yeah, it's the, the both tasks have the same uh, number of uh, evaluations actually of the functions, mm -hmm. and uh, also they they have the same number of generations. Um, yeah, I think that uh, it's it's hard to have uh, intuit intuition about it because um, th I think that this is really recent field and I still haven't seen any visualizations like like this, uh, for example. And I think that um, using these types of visualizations and stuff like that will help. But I think that. Um, for example, uh, if we see this problem, um, the the Eccle function does not um, does not converge in in this uh, in this part of space. So only solutions in in this part of space will know in what directions they should head. Um, but the sphere function will for sure uh, push the 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 solutions uh, towards the optimum. So I guess that if if they have this, if you have these types of problem, that uh, it will be useful.
if you say the screw problem or empty problem, you don't get anything to me. So I can't really understand what you mean if you don't define it between Yeah, okay. I mean I unfortunately I don't yet. Any questions? Anybody? Mm -hmm. I think nobody Yeah, I mean, I was uh, I was also thinking about this as well, but uh, I I don't have any idea yet how to how to uh, prove if this is the yeah. Um. Do I need Hi, to hello. Hi, Alyosha. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah, I cannot, no, I cannot share the screen. You I, cannot? Uh, I have to make a presenter. Yeah, I think so. Yes, is this the only um, way to the speakers? I think you are seeing my screen. No, but the speakers, can you change the speakers to something else? Ah. Uh -huh. Can you talk, uh, Lyosha, just for us to hear? Hi, hello. Pro Okay. Can you hear Ah, <laughs> sabotage, Alyosha, <laughs> internal sabotage <laughs> from the group. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so Hi. let me uh, take the time to introduce uh, Alyosha, um, who is going to present uh, work. I cannot hear you anymore. Can you hear me now, Alyosha? Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's okay. Okay. And we also hear you better. And also we can hear you well. So, okay. Perfect. And also you can see my screen, yeah? Yes, yeah? we can. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. No. Uh, okay, then, uh, Alyosha, please uh, present your work about analyzing diversity of constraints, multi objective optimization test suites. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Thea, for the introduction. And let's go on. Before, <clears throat> before moving to more technical parts of the presentation, I want to give you a bit of a background and a motivation. One of the key elements uh, while benchmarking optimization algorithms is the selection of suitable test problems. And the well-designed benchmark suit uh, should include a wide variety of problems with different characteristics. This way the <coughs> sorry, this way the benchmark problems are diverse enough to highlight the strengths as well as weaknesses of different algorithms. However, until recently, there existed only few and limited techniques to explore constrained multi-objective optimization problems or SMOPs for short. And for this reason, the test suites of SMOPs were insufficiently understood and measuring their diversity was uh, impossible. And to overcome this situation, in our previous work, we experimented with various exploratory landscape analysis or ELA techniques. 
and propose 29 landscape features to characterize uh, smogs. And in this study, study, we use these features to quantify the diversity of the most widely used test suites in constraint multi-objective optimization. Okay, thank you to Andreana. The, we already saw what is a constraint multi-objective optimization problem and I can go on. Actually, what is really important for, for us is the concept of, uh, of a constraint violation. For a single constraint is defined as the maximum value between the constraint and zero. And all the constraint violation are summed into an overall constraint violation and will be here denoted by, by V. And obviously a solution is feasible uh, if and only if the overall constraint violation for this solution equals zero. Okay, let's see now one example. Uh, this is actually a bioobjective version of the well-known C2 DTSZ2 problem. There are two objectives that need to be minimized and one constraint that needs to be satisfied. The search space here is an n-dimensional hypercube and the overall constraint violation is the maximum between the constraint value and zero. And here is only one constraint, so we don't need to sum up any. Okay, let's let's see now how, how we can visualize this problem, this problem. On the left, we have the search space of this problem from the constraint perspective. In more detail, it shows the overall constraint violation value for its solution. Here, darker colors indicate large constraint violations and vice versa. In addition, white areas represent uh, feasible solutions. And the set of all feasible solutions and the union of these feasible areas is called feasible region. And as, so, as I already mentioned here, is, it consists of uh, three components. And also very important concept is um, a basin of attraction or basin for short. The idea is to find all the solutions that uh, within the that are within the optimization attracted to a certain area, usually feasible component. In this particular case, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. In this particular example, mm -hmm. there are two basins uh, separated with two vertical lines at x1 equals 0 0.25 and 0 0.75 and on the <coughs> I'm <coughs> sorry on the right there is a corresponding objective space and the blue areas areas uh, indicate which objective values can be obtained with feasible solutions and pink area indicates objectives values that can be obtained only by feasible solutions. I'm sorry, I need 10 seconds. Okay, let's continue. On this slide, we can see three additional um, examples. The first one, MW6, has uh, many feasible components and basins, and some of these components are really small. Uh, in contrast, uh, MW7 uh, has only one component and also only one basin. And as you can see, it's rather a large uh, component. And finally, the last problem has several basins and only one component, it's here. And this problem is also very rugged. Uh, this means that the overall constraint violation values change uh, really quickly. On the other hand, MW7 is really smooth because as you can see, the values are already similar. Okay, this concludes a rather long introductory part, but it was needed to understand this concept. And let's move to the methodology section. The future proposed in our previous work uh, can be categorized into four main groups. And we'll be here used to, to 
to quantify the diversity of these problems. The first group consists of futures derived um, using the space filling design. There are 10 futures uh, which are mainly used to quantify feasible components and measure the correlation between objectives and constraints. And then the second group <laughs> correspond to the futures derived from the information content. And they are used to express the ruggedness of problem landscapes. The future from the third group are derived from random walks and they quantify the degree of segmentation of the feasible region. There are three such prob uh, features. And finally, the fourth group consists of futures derived from adaptive walks and they are used to describe uh, basins. So to better understand and to easily to, to analyze the future space, uh, we employ the dimensionality reduction technique to embed the future space, which has 29 dimensions into a two-dimensional plane. For this purpose, we use the well-known and widely used uh, T-distributed stochastic, stochastic neighboring embedding, or TSNI for short. It is actually a statistical method designed to represent high-dimensional data into a low-dimensional space, usually 2D plane. And it is important to understand that in general, it preserves only local rela relationship between points, while the global structure is in generally lost. Okay, what about the experimental setup? Um, we analyzed the most frequently used test suites found in the literature. There are nine of them. And since the employed uh, ELA techniques are very greedy, and the required number of solution evaluations increases exponentially with the dimensionality, we were able to derive um, the landscape futures only for small basic, uh, for, sorry, <clears throat> for small dimensions. We include two, three, and five dimensional problems. And besides, uh, we use the default parameter for TSNI and are shown on the slide. Okay, now I'll pre present the results. Uh, on the left, we can see the embedding of the future space as obtained by TSNI. And different colors correspond to different suites and different shapes to different dimensions. We can see some patterns, but however, to be honest, it's quite hard to get any relevant information from this figure. So what we did in addition was to identify regions of problems with similar characteristics. We ended up with four regions uh, as shown on the right. And let's see what kind of problems can be found in each of these regions. The green, actually the green region correspond to highly multimodal problems. These are problems with several feasible components and basins. The problem from this region are rugged and contain only small size sized basins. Oh, yeah, so, oh, sorry. Okay. Then the red region correspond to multimodal problem, rugged problems, and with small feasible regions. The problem from the blue region are also multimodal, rugged, and have small feasible regions. But in contrast with the red region, these problems have positive correlation between the objectives and constraints, and this makes them easier to solve. And finally, the yellow region corresponds to unimodal problems. These are problems with only one basin. And these problems are also smooth and have large feasible regions. So these are the most easier problems. And okay, and now we analyzed uh, the, this test suites with respect to these regions. And as you can see, almost all CTP programs, actually all the CTP programs are located in the yellow region. And therefore many relevant characteristics are poorly represented. And then, then the NCTP fails to sufficiently represent severe, severe multimodality, since it contains no problem from the red and green regions. 
while on the other hand, VCDTZ, LIR problems, and NW are based towards uh, highly multimodal violation landscapes. Then the CDTLZ and DAS problems are mainly located in the green and yellow region. And finally, CF and RCM problems are well spread through the whole embedded future space. And what I really want to highlight here is that RCM suite, which is in contrast to other suites, um, which in contrast to other suites, consists of real world problems, is well spread through the whole future space. So real world problems are very diverse. And on the other hand, we can see that many artificial test suites often fail to represent uh, this diversity enough. And this is a very important shortcoming short coming that uh, needs to be addressed uh, by the community. And well, this brings us to the end of the results section. And let's conclude with some final remarks. In this study, we have employed uh, 29 ELA futures and the TISNI dimensionality reduction technique to measure the diversity of the most frequently used test suites of SMOPs. The results show that the most diverse suites uh, are CF and LCM. But nevertheless, we still suggest to include uh, problems from various test suites for a comprehensive benchmarking. And one of the main limitations of our study is that only low dimensional SMOPs were used in the analysis. And for this reason, a crucial task uh, that needs to be addressed in the future is the extension of this work to large scale problems. And this brings us to the end of the presentation and thank you for your attention. And sorry for... Thank you for being here, although you're not really um, very fast. Yeah. Right? Uh, any questions, please? Let me see if also there are any questions here. Mm. How do I see that? <laughs> No, I cannot see. I don't see any questions. Ah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I have oh, sorry. yeah, go on. So these basins of attractions, these are basically like local optimal or there's something else going on? Uh, I, I couldn't really hear. Uh, if the, the basins question. of attraction are uh, about local optima or what? I, I think... Um, I, sorry, I mean, I mean right. No, 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 no. Oh, pa. Okay, the idea is this, these are some, let's say a sub, this is a subset of, um, of a search space that converge within the optimization, converge to some area. Actually, we have an attractor, for example, here is this feasible component. Mm -hmm. we, you can understand this like a yeah, local, let's say local, um, optimal but this is seen from the for the constraints not the objectives and the idea is that all the solution that would somehow converge towards this attractor represent a basin so these are all solution for example here in this area is this is one basin this is the second basin and this is the third basin okay. actually the uh, all the basins the union of all basins um, represent all the it represents all the <clears throat> sort of space. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, Alyosha, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Okay, so we work on this topic because uh, we know it is uh, actually leading towards better uh, understandability and explainability on one hand of the problems and also on the algorithm performance. Now we yeah. know that um, there is a limitation uh, of this current uh, state of the methodology in the sense that it does not well handle high dimensional problems. But these problems are quite often of this kind. So are there any ideas of how to uh, make this approach uh, efficient even on larger, um, I mean, high dimensional problems? You just mentioned this as a future work. Any more specific? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, here we rely a lot of on this uh, space feeling designs and adaptive works. And all, both techniques needs a lot of function evaluations. And with increasing the dimension, dimension then needs also to increase these initial points. 
So we need to, 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 to actually take a look at different techniques, may, maybe more to focus on random walks and the idea and actually what would be the results. It's actually, we won't be able to, to, to characterize uh, this concept in such a detail, but we will still get some idea. We will still get some idea how many basins are there, if they are large or small. In contrast with this approach we are using now that actually give us more or less an exact number. So they give us an exact number, how many basins are there, how large are there, then so on. In contrast with some not, let's say, not that greedy techniques, we can get, we can still get some ideas, some results, but not, um, not, uh, not exact results, just some, some trends. I okay. don't know if this uh, actually answered the question, but... Did it? Um, well, in a way, yes. The only difficulty is that, of course, the problem is the, the um, complexity grows with, uh, exponentially with the dimension. That, that's the problem, yeah. Yeah, there's a problem for all these um, exploratory landscape analysis techniques. Some, are, some can do better also in high dimensions, but... Um, not all of them. Yeah, sure, yes. But okay, thank you. Thank you uh, a lot, Alyosha, for, <laughs> for being here. But I mean, virtually. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so please, uh, Irne, uh, go ahead and present Side Game, an online benchmark environment for multi agent reinforcement learning. <laughs> Do you need any help? Uh, so, yeah. Andriana, <laughs> Okay. okay, then please go yeah. ahead. Um, hello everyone. Uh, what I have for you is a bit different. Uh, it's a simulation environment with a set of tools for conducting <coughs> experiments in multi-agent reinforcement uh, learning. Just a second. Uh, Alyo uh, Alyosha, can you mute yourself? Sorry, please go no, no problem. At all. Um, only it's not really a general purpose environment, it's uh, more like a specific game. And here I need to give some more context on why this is interesting. There's this blue thing. Oh, there. Uh, get it. <laughs> okay. Um, so games, particularly in their um, virtual forum with clearly definable goals um, are great for evaluating AI, um, particularly in their performance against human players. Um, and while the reinforcement learning was a bit, uh, let's say, underrepresented today, uh, if, you're, if uh, you were at the ceremony and heard Professor Kozak mention um, a remark of, on how far AI has come, what did he say? He said like uh, self-driving cars, but also chess and go. Um, so, um, and particularly for me, uh, more, more inspiring were the last cases, uh, so AlphaStar and OpenAI 5, uh, which tackle modern video games. Um, and to solve them, the authors um, required like unprecedented, unprecedented amounts of compute. You can see like more than half, a, about half a year using about uh, a thousand GPUs and a hundred thousand uh, CPUs. So it's not like an experiment that just anyone can do. Uh, and what I want to highlight here is that they required such amount of compute while at the same time having a much more simplified interface for their agents. So they didn't see um, the image um, like Liquido, but it wasn't even rendered. They just got some vectorized inputs and um, for their outputs, they didn't use uh, like mouse and keyboard analogs. They, um, what we need to do in like multiple actions or like, some amount of time, we could just do in a single step using a single uh, precisely parameterized command. And as a researcher, you kind of ask yourself, what, what's the point in saying, claiming that you have achieved superhuman performance um, if the AI is basically cheating? 
Um, so here, the motivating uh, here I found the motivating needs to um, like to establish uh, an environment uh, which would be still strategically interesting for uh, AI research, but that would also enable an equ equivalent, equivalent interfaces for both AI and human players. Uh, and it turns out that some um, games, some um, types of environments, are more um, now, let's say suitable for this, particularly first-person uh, games. Uh, and I identified Counter Strike as a strategically um, important uh, game. And it also has other um, highlights or things that make it interesting for AI research. Um, here, I would just uh, emphasize that uh, as the majority of modern video games, it's, it's a closed environment. You can't, and if you can't really access its internal uh, states, you can't really do reinforcement learning on it. Um, and um, here I saw no other way around it than just to re-implement it and at the same point, uh, at the same time, um, simplify its observation space so that modern convolutional networks can, uh, can handle uh, the image input uh, while preserving the action space as much as possible so that the rules of the game still apply. Uh, and also the environment had to be well, computationally light and um, the online um, component also um, contributes to the scalability of the whole thing so that it can scale even beyond uh, the compute that you saw before. Uh, so here maybe I should switch to uh, like a video just to show. Um, okay, so, so um, this is a bit too, a lot to take in at once. Um, the thing is, the simplification is to make it 2D, but I um, preserved the egocentric aspect. So positional audio still applies. Uh, you, feel, you still have a limited field of view and the ray, ray tracing and, 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 and such. Uh, and also the, um, the, the screen is, uh, the display is a low, low resolution for a particular reason of, uh, so that convolutional, uh, convolutional neural networks can handle it. But uh, I try to preserve as much information as possible so it's densely packed and um, so the details are very small. So what happens is uh, if you just naively uh, try to use um, convolutional uh, networks, you can quite easily uh, lose the details and their location importance. Uh, and one way, one way around it uh, is to well, sort of incorporate either an implicit or an explicit attention mechanism, um, where uh, if you just focus on a small cutout uh, of the entire image, then you can basically just use existing classification networks. Uh, if it's just a single thing on there, then it's basically classification and you don't need to keep track of everything at once. Um, the audio, as I mentioned, is um, in first person settings. It's important because even it's not redundant. Even if you don't see um, an enemy or, or some unit, uh, you can still maybe hear some information and you can gain a tactical advantage. Uh, so the AI also had, uh, had to have access to this. Um, and well, I could go into detail on how the audio system works here, but the the AI part is you uh, transform the audio chunk uh, into the frequency space and then you can either um, process it sequentially in, like, spectra with spectral vectors or you can um, stack them into an image and then just use um, 2D convolutional uh, networks. Uh, and what this amounts to is well, uh, a neural um, uh, network um, that took something like this. So you can see the, uh, the, the visual uh, pathways, so, uh, the general and the focus line on a cutout. Um, this is the audio pathway, and this mouse and keyboard state sort of mimics uh, human proprioception of how our fingers are positioned on the keyboard and mouse. Um, so this module is uh, just uh, re recurrent cells, uh, so the, the, the network can keep a memory of the, the past and future. Um, uh, and in this configuration, the, um, the coordinates for, uh, for the cutouts, um, for, for the focus, are explicit. Um, which has its drawbacks, as I'll say a bit later. Uh, so I had, a bit, um, I had some problems with parallelization and achieving the, um, the, the required set of optimization to run um, reinforcement learning beyond just some uh, proof of concept um, experiments. Um, and um, so, so what I did was um, instead is to uh, record some um, some sessions and games uh, with, with a few colleagues um, and um, to just do imitation learning uh, right so you you, uh, you store what the 
human player saw and what they did, and the uh, AI agent is supposed to imitate it to the best of their ability. Uh, and this basically translates into, uh, well, if you have all the inputs, uh, all of the outputs discretized, it's basically a classification um, uh, problem, and the loss is basically just cross entropies. Uh, and the drawback that I mentioned before for having an explicit attention mechanism is you need to have labels, right? <laughs> and we didn't really have cameras of where uh, the human brain is focused uh, their eyes. Uh, so I basically needed to go through all the data, uh, data and annotate it by hand. Um, the, so we can see that we had, there wasn't a lot of data. It was about eight hours um, uh, and about uh, at 30 frames per second, this is about uh, 800,000 um, um, images. Um, and everything, all, all that you should take from uh, what you see here is that um, it wasn't enough. Right? Like, uh, you need a lot more data um, for, for the results of mutation learning to make uh, more sense. This is highly overfitted. And I should once again show you a video to uh, show what I mean. Uh, the, this is sped up. This is uh, sped up by four, four times. So it, it has to travel um, viewing, uh, using different views. Um, it, it can sort of navigate the environment without um, bumping into things too much. Uh, and it sort of seems to go into um, the direction of a tactical goal and take cover and stuff. Uh, but when I try to provoke it and get a more aggressive response from it, it, um, it didn't quite deliver. Uh, so in order to use imitation learning as a better starting point for uh, later enforcement learning um, or just, just to have better results in general, you would need a lot more data. Um, another thing I would highlight um, that stems from the online component of the environment is that you can scale this, the reinforcement learning experiments well past um, to just local um, uh, lo lo local networks. Um, so you, you can't really transfer um, large tensors between uh, um, and very remote uh, locations across the continent, um, but you can um, but you can play games across the continent, right? So uh, the idea is that uh, institutions like universities or in institutes uh, each uh, re reserve their um, pool of uh, agents and handle training uh, handle the training, and they collectively participate in shared uh, simulations. Um, so this is possible and it can scale well beyond um, the compute that you saw at the beginning. Um, so this is a bit uh, surface level presentation um, for the references and um, the details I would refer you to um, the, the, the thesis on which this is based. Um, but even there, it's, it's, uh, it's too much to put even there all the details. So you, you can uh, access the codes on the public repository. You can run the um, environment. You can uh, organize your own experiments. Um, it's out there for the public good. So um, thank you for your attention. Anybody online? So at some point you mentioned audio. Yeah. So could you please explain again or more detail where does this audio come into this whole scheme? Okay, so um, if I show the um, the other games, um, it's a bit more, but if you can see, um, the, the view is third person and you can view the camera around and all that you can hear, you can also see. So the audio is kind of redundant, you don't need it. And the agents that were trained on these games, they, they didn't use it. They just um, they ignored the audio, basically. But in first person, um, yeah, this is not the case. Uh, right? Um, someone could be hiding behind that crate or uh, under that wall, but you could still hear them. You could still gain some information from audio that you can't uh, gain just from, uh, from sight. Um, so, and in this case, we, human players, do get um, both uh, visual and audio signals, and it would be a big handicap for the AI to, to not uh, give it audio information. Uh, so the game, uh, the environment needed to support it, of course. <clears throat> yes. uh, so, okay, if I if I understood correctly, and your problem was not having enough data, and the bottleneck for, for getting more of it is uh, the, the, the labeling for this cutout that was required. 
Is that correct? Otherwise, people could just play and you would get data. Um, if I had the option to um, set up this experiment um, correctly, uh, I would mount cameras uh, in, in, in front of uh, the human players and to track their eye movement. Um, and I would obtain, uh, the things would matter. You, you wouldn't have to annotate things by hand. Uh, and ideally you would uh, record much more, um, much longer sessions than what we had. Uh, eight hours is really not uh, enough. The precedents, um, like for training uh, Alpha Star, uh, uh, for training Alpha Star on, on the game on the left, and even for uh, for Go, uh, we, they also had imitation rank uh, as a baseline uh, and a starting point. They had like millions of games, <laughs> um, so magnitudes more of uh, uh, hours. But if I may just say, so the, the the problem is the annotation, I guess, because uh, everybody is playing games now and uh, putting YouTube videos on them playing. Yeah, yeah. So there should be enough. Of yeah, the we're not yeah. yeah, if you want to learn from demonstrations, uh, then yeah, you, you need to know what those actions that were taken were. Uh, yeah, right. So just the video is not enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, and well, if you use uh, the env this environment, uh, then you, you can really record uh, the, 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 the actions. Or, or rather, uh, the client communicates with the server, right? And, uh, uh, and you can store those packets and you can use them to re simulate uh, the session. So you can. Um, basically extract all that the, the, the humans did um, uh, pressed on the keyboard and on the mouse, uh, but the eye movement uh, needs to be recorded externally. Um, I, I don't have this component, it's, it's a bit of a less standard component. Sure. You can also formulate the network differently or use an implicit attention mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you, if you could do away with this, yeah. Uh, Explicit attention, then it would be kind of easier. Yeah, much easier. And I also didn't quite understand: is, is this game of yours somehow compatible with the real Counter Strike or not? Pretty, it's highly uh, well. Um, so, if you want to get data, yeah. do people have to play your Counter Strike, or can they play the regular Counter Strike, and you also somehow get useful data? Before I ran out of time, I tried to. Before I ran out of time for um, the project, uh, I tried to uh, do just that to extract data from the real thing. Um, the the constraints uh, for me while designing this environment was to make it as compatible with the real thing as possible. Um, at least you should be able to use some uh, statistics, um, but I think that. Okay, so some things are simplified, like you can't, you don't have access to all the items that the real thing has. Um, uh, but to a large degree, I think they are compatible. Um, um, sorry, let, let us stop right there, but we're already late. No, no, that was uh, very nice. Thank okay. you. Thank